why do we have money? Why do we use money? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. For life? Sure, okay. But why do we have, why don't we exchange things, for example? Or why don't we do something else? Why do we need money? Hmm? It's convenient? Sure. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the same same type of quantifier, uh -huh. the same type of measurement to measure how valuable things are. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any other ideas? Okay, so it's convenient. Uh, it's a way to quantify things. Sure. So some of the early economists thought of that, and when we talk about money, usually the conversation starts with. Adam Smith, who you've probably heard of at least, or perhaps read some of his work. And uh, he does indeed tell a similar story. Now that story is in almost every economic textbook, but it's not necessarily 100% true. So let's go through that story first and then see to what extent it's actually uh, applicable to the reality of what happened in history. So Adam Smith, like many of uh, the other, for example, ancient Greek philosophers starts by reasoning through comparing people to animals, in this case, dogs. So many of the Greek philosophers used to think uh, of people slash humans as something that's different from the natural world of animals. And that was what made people special. So what he thought of was, well, trading must be something that makes people really special. Why? Because when you see two animals or two dogs or whatever, they don't trade. They find a bone, they take it, they go away with it, and they don't tend to swap or trade with things. But people do. And that's what Adam Smith found really fascinating as a starting point. So from then on, he moved to uh, discuss the idea that when you're going and uh, taking something from somebody that you need, so for example, if you're going to the butcher or the brewer or the baker, so you might need some food or you might need bread, the reason why he or she gives you that good is because you give them something that they're interested in. So he thought if you have nothing that the baker is interested in, the baker is not going to give you bread. Now, at the time, that was a very interesting thought. So at the time when Adam Smith lived, money wasn't necessarily everywhere. There wasn't enough money, first of all, to go around everywhere. So a lot of people had much more interpersonal relations. A lot of people knew their local baker or their, their local butcher. In, in some smaller places today, that might still be the case. You have a relationship with them. And uh, Adam Smith didn't necessarily think that way. He thought that they were defending their own interests rather than developing a relationship with you. And Adam Smith thought that because of this, because people protect their own interests, that's why we develop specialization. So that's why different people specialize into doing different things and then they can trade more efficiently. And he thought that this kind of specialization came from uh, the environment, so he didn't think it was natural, but he thought it was much more uh, habits, customs, experience, etc. So essentially we got to the idea that the desire to trade, i.e. the desire to defend your own interest, leads to a division of labor, which essentially facilitates trade and uh, makes the economy go round. Now, later economists in the 19th century, they reasoned around the same idea and added to it, talking about a double coincidence of wants. So what these economists came up with is the idea that it's really problematic to swap things if we don't need each other's possessions at the same time. So if I have a cow and you have chickens, maybe I don't need your chickens right now, but you need my cow right now. And this is why we're not going to swap them at the moment, because there is a, a conflict of interest. We don't have the same interest at the same time. So this problem, Jevons and other economists called it the double coincidence of wants. 
and then also the reason around other problems that have to do uh, with uh, not using money. So for instance, well, if we're swapping cow for a few chickens, well, can you divide the chickens? Is a cow worth three chickens or three and a half chickens? Am I gonna kill the chicken, split it in half? So we can't divide goods. And there's also no common measure of value. So every time you have to think again from, from scratch, thinking differently for every item. So what does everybody want? Everybody wants, for some reason, gold. It's shiny, it's flashy. We don't really know why everybody likes it that much, but there are many theories, and that became money. Now, in economics textbooks, this is what they tell you. First, we had barter, so people would swap things, and then we thought that was inconvenient and we made money, and then we came up with concepts like credit. So we came up with concepts like taking money for a while and paying interest and doing things like that. Now here's the problem. When anthropologists and archaeologists and all kinds of people that study society tried to find evidence for this, they found none. Zero. So when you look at ancient societies, it doesn't look like anybody did these things in this order. And for instance, what Caroline Humphrey says is, well, there's no example of a barter economy, pure and simple. So no example of a barter economy has ever been described, let alone the emergence from it of money. So if you look at actual societies, people never swapped things like that. They never thought, I want this right now, you can't give it to me right now, then done. I'm not going to trade with you. They thought of it in much more complicated ways. So if you look at the way that uh, anthropologists have documented early societies, here's what we come up with. Well, Adam Smith's idea would be that they would spot trade. They trade on the spot. I give you something, you give me something else. But the problem is that people used to live in small villages where everybody knew each other and they were neighbors. So they would see each other every day. They would see each other every week, every month. So if they start swapping on the spot, that doesn't make sense because they live together. So time wasn't really the way that Adam Smith thought about it time was on a longer scale. It was sustained. So the way that things used to work uh, back then, at least roughly, according to anthropologists, was, well, so if you have a nice cow and I'm your neighbor, I might go and say, well, you know, that's, that's a nice cow right there. And then you might say, well, you know, here you go. You can have it. And then you give me the cow. So from a compliment, I tend to get a gift. And then once I give you the cow, then you know that you owe me something. You don't know exactly what it is, but you know that you owe me something. That's roughly like a cow. So sometimes it might be something like, well, you know, oh, there's a nice necklace right there. And, uh, you know, and then you have to give me a necklace. Or sometimes it might be something that has to do with social relations. So it might be something like, well, my son is in love with your daughter. And then that, you know, that's not spot trade. So that's something that's much more uh, socially bound. So essentially what happened, according to anthropologists, was the exact opposite. Things worked in reverse. So the first thing that came was credit. And when you think of that system, well, you know, a compliment, a gift, etc., that's a form of credit because the moment you give me the cow, then, you know, I take it and then I have to give you something back. It's like I've taken credit from you. It's like I've taken it from a bank almost, but it's not a bank. And then after that came money, and finally came barter. So the way that anthropologists actually documented it was the opposite of what Adam Smith thought in the early days. And if you look at the ways that uh, um, societies worked in the past, so for instance, if you look at books like The Gift, they talk about redistribution and they talk about models that are actually still present in a lot of societies today. So for instance, if you go to India, if you, if you uh, talk to Hindu families, how, the, how money there works is, is uh, rather strange according to Western standards. So the extended family, so for instance, that would include not just, you know, uh, you know, a mom, dad, and a kid, but that would include the whole extended family with their uncles and their cousins and, and whatever. They would get all the money and put it together in a pile. So uh, when, when the child reaches a certain age, so, you know, it could be 20 or 25, I don't know how they work at the moment, but then the child can take some money and make an investment. And if that investment is successful, 
then he or she can take more money and make another investment. If that investment is not successful, then they can't take money again. So essentially there were uh, modes of distributing money that were very different from what we think of uh, in modern economics textbooks. So that brings the, the, the question, well, when did people start coming up with the equivalence of money for objects? Because if people used to have these different gift modes of swapping things, when, well, when did we start having uh, prices, essentially, quote unquote, for things? And the answer is legal codes. So when you look at, for example, early medieval Europe, you don't see any markets in the way that we know them today, but you see a lot of legal codes where you have specific prices for every object. And the reason they were there were because we needed them for penalties. So when somebody violated somebody's property or stole something, that's when, according to the law, we needed to punish them at a certain price, essentially. So that's why we, we needed money to start with. And money emerged essentially when people got angry. And barter, which is what Adam Smith thought was the source of everything, actually emerged later. So when you see places where barter is widespread and cash supply is limited, what you see is that they use money as a unit of account. So essentially money still exists, but it's not real money. We just know how much it costs, and every time you come and take something, or uh, we tend to swap something, we put it, uh, we, we put it somewhere on a tab according to uh, the value that it should have. So we needed money to know how much things cost to start with. And in ancient empires, for instance, in Egypt, uh, we, can see, uh, we can see how places operated like that. Before that, people uh, traded by swapping things, uh, by using tabs, so where they would keep a long record of what you've taken in the past uh, for a number of reasons. And we know that because there was insufficient money, physically there was not enough money, there was not enough gold. We know it also because of scales. So they didn't have scales that were good enough to measure the amount of silver to buy, for example, a hammer. So there was no way for them to do that. And it's not because they couldn't do it. They had the technology, but they just didn't do it. Because people, at least according to what we know, used to operate on tabs. So essentially, the first form of money was not physical money, it was almost like virtual money. It was almost like a physical tab of Alipay, where you tend to write down what, what you've bought uh, and for how much. So, that brings us to the idea of money and relationships. So essentially when we trade, when we swap things, sometimes in the modern economy you're swapping on the spot. You give money, you take something. But at other times it's much more socially bound and you tend to keep a relationship with the person that you're swapping things with. Because you might swap with them again, you might swap your money for something uh, with them again, or you might work with them again, or uh, you might essentially uh, develop this into a partnership in the long term, especially if you're in the area of business. So if you look at long-term relationships, even today, they are absolutely central to import and export and international trade at large. So the things that happened thousands of years ago in small villages, they tend to still guide the way that the economy works and the way that company-to-company -company relationships work um, and, and form the modern world. Uh, so the importance of relationships differs substantially by country, obviously, but in most countries it tends to be uh, very important and there is a number of findings that we already know about it. So for instance, the amount traded within a relationship rises as the relationship ages. The probability that it survives also increases as it ages. The longer it survives, the longer the companies involved or the people involved tend to cooperate. And we also know that source countries, especially for import and export with better institutions, tend to have longer relationships because people are protected by contracts or by the law. So these types of relationships typically fall into uh, three areas. The first one is what we call transactional or distant relationship. So this type of relationship 
is the quote-unquote coldest one. So in this case, you're basically just doing a one-time transaction, one off, and you're gone. That's why we call it transactional. The second one is value added. So it's a continuing relationship, but you're still not the only person that they trade with. So you bring something more to the table, but they don't trust you enough to make you the main partner. And the third type of relationship is partnering or collaborative relationship where the two parties are particularly close. So looking at them into a bit more detail, if you have a transactional relationship, usually buyers prefer this when the market is stable and when many suppliers are available. So if you have many suppliers, then of course you can go to the one that's, for example, cheapest or most, or most convenient at the time and do a one-off transaction because you're not worried the suppliers are going to be gone. You can do a one-off and then find another one if you need to. Uh, and sellers prefer this when the buyer's sales and profit potentials are low. So the focus here is usually on finding competitive prices, on sourcing things on time, and on doing a transaction that suits both parties' interests at that particular moment. When you look at a value-added relationship, it focuses much more on understanding the buyer or the seller's needs better than other competitors. So if you have a value-added relationship, it means in some way you are better than the other options that they have at the moment on the market. So in this case, buyers are usually what we call split loyals. So they tend to have two or three suppliers and uh, one of them, obviously, at least, uh, is adding uh, an extra value to the relationship. The seller's objective here is to get a maximum share of the market. So if you have, for instance, three suppliers and you are uh, splitting the market with them uh, in three at the moment, and you are one of the you're one of the suppliers, say it's 33% each. 33, 33. If you're one of the suppliers, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get more than 33. You're trying to get 40, you're trying to get 50, you're trying to get 60, so you're trying to move towards a closer partnership eventually. Uh, and the final type of relationship that we're going to expand on is clearly the partnering or collaborative relationship. So in this case, if you keep moving and you eventually take up all of the market, then you become their partner, or even if it's not at least, uh, even if it's not all of the market, then it's gonna be a large portion of the market, you become their partner and you start to collaborate in the long term. So in this case, when companies cooperate, they might set objectives together and then check on how they've done together rather than setting their own agenda. And they might also share potentially their resources and their data, and that includes data about the market and data about different customers. So, in these types of relationships, there is one key component, and it is always trust. Now, trust is defined in business textbooks usually as a willingness to depend on someone else to do something. So if you are, for instance, a distributor, you are depending on the supplier to give you uh, these goods on time, in a good condition, you trust them that they will provide them in the proper condition and you can assure your clients, for example. And trust can be very easily broken because usually when trust gets broken once, then the relationship tends to uh, go to bad places. Now. Establishing these types of relationships, especially a collaborative relationship, is usually very difficult because there is information asymmetry. So the seller usually knows more about the product than the buyer. So the seller knows exactly how good that product is. If you're buying, for instance, some washing liquid and you're trying to, uh, to, to wash, uh, for instance, your, your plates at home, the seller knows exactly how good that washing liquid is. The seller knows how much you have to scratch to get it off. And sometimes it might be less and sometimes it might be more. But they can tell you whatever they like the first time you're making a transaction. 
So it's important to provide accurate information to establish trust. Or, for instance, the buyer also has some leverage. The buyer might not pay on time, and then that might break the relationship. So when you talk about trust, there are two main ways of establishing trust. And the first one is psychological, and it has to do with evaluating what's in the other person's mind and how they behave and what signals they give you. And the second one uh, is economic, and it's much more linked to contracts and enforcement. So when you, when you sign that contract, do you have the potential power to enforce it somehow? Do you have the potential power to file a case if the other side doesn't comply with the contract? So Northwestern University have uh, done a, a great project on trust, and it's very hard to determine the factors for trust, but they've come up with these three uh, components or factors for trust that are very useful as a framework. And the first one is competence. So the first one is, is your partner capable of delivering on their promise? Or are they capable of delivering on the deal? The second one is honesty. Is your partner telling you the truth or at least what they believe to be true? Are they making a genuine attempt to communicate clearly the most truthful information? And the third factor for trust is benevolence. So does the partner involved consider your interests? Are they thinking of you as well and not just of their own interests. So looking at these factors for trust and looking at the history of money, we can clearly follow that the very first transactions which were done on credit and which were done by people that know each other and work long term were based on that same trust and on that same type of social relationships as the big business deals that are done today. So based on these ideas, Look, uh, let's look at the handout in front of you. So it has...